Good evening, everybody. Welcome for welcome. Welcome and thank you for coming this evening. My name is Cynthia Cutting, and I'm the director at the Museum of the White Mountains, and very proud to be presenting um, this um, panel discussion today in collaboration with the Center for the Environment and June Hammond Roman and um, our Adventure Education Department. Thank you, Christian. Um, and um, also really want to um, thank the Waterman Fund, who has uh, funded both this evening and a portion of the exhibit that, that sparked this idea. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, on view at the Museum of the White Mountains right now, through the end of this semester, through December 13th, is an exhibit called Walking in the Whites, a poet painter dialogue, which features the poetry of Tim Muscat, who you will hear this evening, um, and painter, uh, paintings by Catherine Field. It's an amazing exhibit. Um, it's really wonderful and, and worth, worth a visit. And downstairs in the museum is a, um, a, re a related exhibit that answers or tries to answer the question, why do we hike, with lots of different prompts and ways for you to participate. So thank you if you already filled out your little questionnaire for tonight. Um, those um, questionnaires will be included in the area that we're kind of polling, why do we hike, um, in the museum. And if you haven't got one, you can do that on your way out. Um, it's a little checklist, easy to do. Um, thank gosh, I'm not the one talking tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm so excited to be here, and I'm really, really excited to have such an amazing panel. And I'm going to let um, June introduce them. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Cynthia. So again, welcome everybody. And um, a little bit of a backstory, I think, about how this idea for this panel discussion came together. Um, there, it was Cynthia and I had chatted, and I guess talked to Christian Bison from a the state about this exhibit um, that is ongoing that Cynthia mentioned and wanting to try to bring in another venue, another way to get people to think about uh, hiking in the White Mountains. Um, in addition, um, the Waterman Fund, which in full disclosure, we have three board members up here. <laughs> Myself, um, Ryan Harvey, and Will Comenza are all on the board. So there's this collaborative effort, and I work here at Plymouth State, so we wear several different hats. But um, the Waterman Fund is engaged in trying to, um, is in, interested really in protecting wilderness and alpine areas. So it was a natural um, way for us to support this exhibit and this effort tonight. In addition, we wanted to highlight um, a couple of authors from our um, book that we help support new wilderness voices. So two of the panelists actually are authors from the book and have, we're going to be sharing a little bit from that too. So there's multiple aspects to this tonight and we certainly want participation from the audience also as we go through the next <laughs> next little bit here. For, we have till about nine o'clock. We'll see how, how far we get. But um, first I should introduce the panelists. Uh, on the far end over there is uh, Christian Bison, who's a professor here at Plymouth State. Uh, next to him is Ryan Harvey. And I'm not gonna go through all the biographies. You've got that in your handout to read. Um, next to Ryan is Marianne Leberman. And then Sally Manikian. We should have had name tags up here, I think. <laughs> Will Comeza, who I think came the furthest, right, from Concord, Mass. That's true. Yes, thank you for driving all the way. And last but not least, Tim Muscat, who is the poet, who's the uh, part of the actual exhibit over at the museum. So we're trying to cover lots of bases here tonight in many ways. Um, to help get us started, I just had a couple of thoughts uh, that I wanted to share for me personally. Um, in the spirit of also recognizing the Watermans, got Laura and Guy Waterman, um, I wanted to just share a quote, kind of paraphrasing something that they had written about, uh, really about the diversity of our individual dialogue with mountains. And they said, for some, the mountains hold extreme physical and mental tests. For some, they hint long sweeps of geological vents. For some, they induce romance. And for others, political crusade. And for some, they are a fitness center for exercise. And for some, they are holy places for contemplation. So I think tonight we want to explore all these ideas and others that you and the panelists may have and just think about different perspectives as we get into our discussion about why do we hike. So to start off, we've asked each of the panelists to respond to the question of why do you hike or why do we hike. So Ryan's offered to go first. <laughs> so here you go. <laughs> 
So this was a daunting question, actually, for me, because it's something I never really considered. I've never actually asked my question of why I hike. It just, it's just, I just, that's what I do. I walk, I hike. Uh, so I really had to look back at like how, how it all started for me, in a sense, was when I was, like, when I was a kid, I didn't like sports like at all. Team sports, it was not really into group work, wasn't into it. And I stumbled upon hiking and as a way of like a sport, sort of, but something of a sport of self-reliance. And at that time, it was more of a way of getting out there, seeing uh, hiking mountains, seeing seeing new territory. I'm really into geography and math, so it's another way of just knowing the landscape I lived in. So that was, that was when I was a teenager. But now, as I look back and like why I continue, like what, because I could just easily just drive around and. You know, look at scenery, do the touristy things that most of us do, and a lot of people do, but why do I continue to keep on walking and hiking on a trail now, you know, 20 years after, 25 years after? And I really think, at least for me, my personal experience, on the basic level, like as a human being, it's like one of the things we do best. It, I mean, it seems, it's so basic, we forget. That's what we do, we walk. That, and it's, and there's something very, there, there's something primitive about it, but it's, uh, I think I, you can gain a lot of satisfaction by just walking. I mean, there's a lot of tradition, you think, in the sense of pilgrimage in different cultures, of people walking hundreds, thousands of miles. Um, so there must be something to that. And I, and I feel like in my personal experience, um, there's something to that. <laughs> but in another respect, uh, for me, I think... So, I think there was a change in maybe my uh, my outlook as I hiked more, as I climbed more, as I was in the mountains more. I think something. I, I think that there was something transformative, and I, I can't really speak eloquently to that. But all I can say is that most of the time, at least my mental environment, I'm not. If I'm in, if I'm somewhere, my mental environment is not usually uh, in congruence with my the external environment. I'm, you know, we're thinking a lot. We're uh, contemplating what we just did, what we're about to do, we're strategizing. But when I'm hiking, eventually that sort of drops out, and it's more of like in the moment, and more in the environment I'm actually in. I think, in a way, and it's almost cliche, but there is something very meditative, meditative about just walking, hiking. Um, and it's contemplative in a very simple way, where like my, the, our inner environment is also reflecting external environment. We're, we're almost like body and mind are synchronized and not like attached. Because I think most of the time we're not really in our bodies. We're just we're just here. You know, we think we're here. But you know, I'm really into science and brain stuff. So like our brain also incorporates our body. Yeah, you know, we're we're feeling beings. So I think hiking and uh, walking, we're we almost are more embodied than we typically are. At least I am. You know, when I'm hiking. Um, Great. And just the beauty. I mean, back. So I like your thoughts about the simplicity of it too, sort of the primitive aspect of walking and hiking. But who wants to go next? That's the, we didn't. I'll go next. Okay, thank you, Marianne. So when I was thinking about this, I'm like, Ooh, I grew up in a family where we skied and we sailed and we went camping, but I can never think of a time where as a family we went hiking. That might have been part of our camping trip or something, but that wasn't why we went. And so I really don't think I became a hiker until I started working for the Forest Service 34 years ago. And I've been working in, for the Forest Service in recreation for almost all of those years. So a lot of that was, whether it was hiking and patrolling in the wilderness or building part of the Continental Divide Trail out in Colorado, or working here, um, I worked on Mount Washington the Snow Ranger, so I hiked up and down that Tux Trail a gazillion times. Um, and then I found I was also hiking in my off time just to try and get to know where I worked a little bit more. And then as I um, had a family, I wanted to share some of those really cool places, because if you 
I guess my one wish for all of you guys when you're looking for your careers or your careers that you have days where you're like, oh my God, they pay me for this. <laughs> and I've had many of those out on the National Forest. So I take my kids out now to show them those places. That's great. I just want to make one comment because I'm not sure it was in Marianne's biography that she mentions being a snow ranger up on Mount Washington, Tuckerman Ravine area for 12 years. But she fails to mention that she's the only woman to have ever had that job. So just a very noteworthy. Anyway, um, who wants to go next? Will? Anyone? Why not? <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, first, I'll say that I agree with everything that these two just said. And um, I'll go from there. So um, I also started hiking, as I imagine uh, many of you who are hikers did, as a kid and, and with family. And so I think one of my earliest um, associations with hiking was of um, going up mountains with my father where, uh, and this, this may be the most uh, powerful memory I have of this as a child, he ceased to be just my father and I saw him in moments where um, he was himself bewildered, you know, literally bewildered. That is, you know, we'd have moments on mountaintops where storms were coming in, where we got a little lost. And, I, you know, I think there was something for me really evocative about those moments, you know, being with my dad as I got to see him as another human being who was fragile and occasionally afraid. And um, those moments stick with me. Um, I also was lucky enough um, as a really young person um, to spend the better part of a decade uh, hiking uh, sort of professionally um, in part and then um, I've through hiked the Appalachian Trail so I've, I've had an opportunity to spend um, you know, several months on end on a trail. Um, I may have more to say about that later, but um, that's an experience that still really honestly haunts me. I mean, it still vivid, uh, visits me in my dreams, and um, it's something I'm still trying to unpack. And, and in that case, uh, there was something really particularly powerful about uh, months on end, you know, on, on the trail. Um, I made a terrible mistake after spending much of a decade hiking, I went to graduate school to try to figure out why I'd done all that um, hiking. It was an expensive mistake, too. Um, so I don't recommend that. But, but uh, one of the things that occurred to me somewhere in those years um, where I acquired maybe some language that was at least helpful to me in thinking through this kind of experience um, was a, a sense about um, how some folks define uh, what is sacred or ceremonial. One thing that has stuck with me and that I found very useful is a notion um, that um, you can define something that is sacred as um, that which makes present in a particular time, in a particular place, um, what is always true everywhere. And um, for me, there is something about hiking, um, especially in the context of, of the mountains around here, almost a kind of a sacred agreement, you know, that you enter into with the landscape where, uh, you know, in the course of this hike, you're going to actually, I think as, as Ryan was talking about, you're going to pay attention. You know, you're going to really be there. And of course, we know we should always do that everywhere, but there's something about defining a time uh, in which that's, that's going to happen, you know, and, and I've, I've continued to find that um, to be terribly important. I'll, I'll simply add that um, I now have uh, kids. I have my own kids who are 9 and 11, and I find myself... Um, reliving some of my early experiences of hiking through their eyes. I also go hiking increasingly with students, um, a former student, um, I'm looking at a former student right now, um, and, and it's no less true with them that I, I now get to experience um, some of, of this through them. One more thing I'll add, um, this becomes maybe in, increasingly important to me as I um, launch into this stage of my life. Um, I find that it's important for me occasionally still to get into um, what one novelist called the right kind of trouble. You know, I mean, generally my happiness is pretty Falstaffian. It's, I'm comfortable and, you know, I like to be in warm, safe places. And yet I do find that every now and then there's something important about getting out um, into a place which is a little bit more risky, if that makes any sense at all. So that keeps me going back to Great, thank you, Will. Uh, Sally? Sure. Um, I'm happy to go forth because it enabled me to uh, map out a much more fitting uh, 
an honest answer for myself. Um, I've been fighting with this question all week and um, have been uh, giving only snide remarks in my <laughs> comments, in my notes as I prepared. So it was good to like get it out as listening to everyone else and kind of focus on the true story. Um, lately I've been using the term, I need to walk uphill for a while. Um, I don't actually think I use the word hike. I don't know if that means anything. It may not. But I talk a lot about walking uphill. And from there, it made me think about three strategic moments in my pre-25-year-old self where I walked uphill and actually almost didn't make it all the way up the hill. One was on the Ethan Pond Trail when I was 16 on my first backpacking trip. Another was on the Amadou Supervene Trail when I was 19 on my first professional outdoors job almost uh, 20 years ago. And uh, another was when I was 25 and I was coming up Lowe's Path to Grain Up um, for my first spring in 2007. And the reasons why those stuck out is that I didn't grow up in a hiking family. Um, I grew up in a family dominant, dominated by disability, so actually able-bodied experiences were not something I ever experienced growing up. Um, we were constantly limited by what our family could do together, so we spent a lot of time in motorhomes and driving. Um, I grew up in southern New Hampshire, not near any mountains. I had no one to take me hiking. I still actually don't know how I ended up climbing uphill. And I think those three persistent experiences, experiences I sought out myself, I found the early versions of the Appalachian Mountain Club's Teen Wild Adventures on my own time and convinced my parents, my, my, mother, my mother, pay me to, to pay for me to go there. Still don't know why. And I almost didn't make it. I, the Ethan Pond Trail is not a long trail. It's like two miles. And uh, I actually, mid-sentence, stopped and was like, no, this is just not going to work. The Amanusa Gravine Trail, I'd fought hard for the Appalachian Mountain Club to hire me as hut crew in 2001, as 19 years old. I made it halfway up the path, and I just sat down. My crew members hiked past, and I said, no, this is not for me. I don't belong here. And Lowe's Path, I was 25. I was going up to Greynog to be hired to work as a spring caretaker. I had fought for that job as well. I'd spent the winter working at Cardigan Lodge. All the signals that I had been taught, had, taught, had, had, had shown me was that I didn't belong. I wasn't fast enough, I wasn't fit enough, I didn't go to the right school, I didn't know the right language. I went to college out of the country. I grew up in an, un, in an unabled family. Why did I belong in the outdoors? But yet I kept walking uphill. Um, despite all these reasons that kept me from walking uphill. And I became a professional hiker for 10 years. Um, I worked for the Appalachian Mountain Club managing a backcountry trails program, probably the most similar to Mary Ann's experience, spending a lot of time going to remote places and um, following that ribbon of a path. Once in a while bushwhacking, but mostly following a ribbon of a path uphill in a, in a careful groove. I'm not a professional hiker anymore, but I still walk uphill. And now I walk uphill mostly because um, I'm, a, I'm a professional sled dog musher, and I value that time traveling over distances with my dogs in the summertime because it mirrors the experience we have in the wintertime together, traveling together and working together as a team. The time we spend together in the summer, even though we're only walking six miles instead of mushing for 200, mirrors and supports that team dynamic year-round. Um, and that's not exactly answering the question, but that's how I have experienced and how I'm thinking about answering that question tonight. I guess we got to think about going downhill at some point too, right? <laughs> I don't like going downhill anymore. I actually really like going uphill. <laughs> downhill is hard on the knees. Uh, Tim, do you want to sure. go? I'm very shy, so I have a statement. Um, I'm 58, and uh, I've been hiking in the White Mountains since I was three years old. Why do we hike? I don't have any idea why we hike and what ideas I might put forward as to why I hike could be summarily reduced to speculation by philosophy, to endorphins by physiology, and to neurosis by psychology. Let me throw a few things out there nonetheless. I am sure you have all heard at some point in your lives some version of the Delphic maxim, know thyself. And I stress here that it's a Delphic maxim, meaning it is first and foremost oracular and therefore not at all straightforward, at least not in the way of directives we hear all the time like brush your teeth 
or take out the garbage, or please leave me alone. Three things I know roughly about myself then and am particularly aware of when I venture into mountains. One, I am sensitive. Two, I am broken. And those of you who are broken will understand in an instant precisely what I mean. Three, I have been looking all my life for a place to call home. So, and this is Annie Dillard's so, by the way, serving as summation, sigh, and springboard all at once, carrying these three weightless, though at times infinitely burdensome things with me into every hike I set out on. In the same way, I carry in my pack a pocket knife compass, an ingenious little weather impermeable cylinder filled with waterproof matches whenever I head into the mountains, no matter the distance or duration of my going. I know these three things about myself about as well as I have ever known anything. On sensitivity. Sensitivity is something that in our country, and this has been the case for hundreds of years, is generally not permitted or encouraged or championed or treasured. To say of another, however sympathetically he is sensitive, rings of the pejorative. This country has always been about, on so many levels, guns and steel, and for men in particular, machismo. Now, I have been sensitive all my life, I came out that way. So, got, so I go up into mountains because mountains provide space for my sensitivity. They give it a wide berth and bequeath it an equally wide compassion. On brokenness. When you are broken as a child, you spend the rest of your life looking for the childhood you never had. Brokenness makes you lonely with a very private grief and it makes you a seeker of comfort, of peace, even if that peace is ephemeral, momentary, like a shape-shifting view. Nothing in my formative years was constant, supportive, nurturing, or sane. The conditions in which I grew up were volatile and, frankly, terrifying. No part of me, and I mean that literally, was safe. In mountains, then, I find not simply safety, shelter, refuge, but an all-encompassing sanctity as well. Put differently, to say the mountains are holy to me would be an understatement. They are life of my life, soul of my soul. On that place to call home, as I look back over the poems I have written in my lifetime, and poems, I should note, saved me from ruin long ago, as the mountains, poems themselves, have saved me over many years from the worst aspects of both myself and the world. I see that many of them concern homelessness, or more accurately, houses or domiciles, or most roundly, places where what I will call as delicately as I can, hominess was not to be found. What I have discovered in the White Mountains, what I find every time I am in their magnificent midst, is in no uncertain terms, of all, of, in no uncertain terms, all the things I never knew as a child. The bounty and beneficence of calm, the richness of tranquility, the security of silence, the beatitude, indeed the blessedness of the serene, and yes, even something like the palpable, healing, everyday comfort of love. I am, you could fairly say, drawn to mountains, not to paraphrase Mallory, because they are there, but because there is something about them I can only call companionable. Companionable because, walking up into them, there is something like being. Being that listens, I think often of Wordsworth's strangest simile, one of those open fields which, 
shaped like ears, make green peninsulas on Ethwaite's lake, and being that nurtures, upholds, and protects. Like Dogen, the ancient Japanese priest, poet, philosopher, I must also believe that mountains talk among themselves while we sleep. And speaking of sleep, after a long day in the company of mountains, the elixir of exhaustion coursing through my bloodstream, I generally enjoy a tired dog's rest. And my dreams, after such wild hiking, are for the most part divine. <laughs> That's fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Christian, um, I'm going to see. <laughs> this may take a second to turn the projector on, because being a professor, he brought some slides. Just two slides. It's not going to work. And it's not coming on. So uh, I started a question. As a... Here we go. Why do we hike? But I was thinking as to the why why I hike. And I'll be very quickly. Uh, I hike because it's a big part of my profession. Uh, a big part of my job in adventure education is to use hiking as a modality for instruction and learning. So that we might explore this a bit later on. But when I saw the question is why do we hike, is because what I discovered through some of my research is that it is part of your genes. A bit what you know you were talking about. So it's called ancestral. So if you look at the next slide here. Pretty fun, it's a bit fun thing to see that. Uh, <laughs> I like it. So, Homo habilis, uh, 2.4 million years ago. Maybe one more click here to see okay. who is Homo habilis. Look at this beautiful oh. couple here. <laughs> uh, hikers. Um, <laughs> you know, so if you think about it, you know, uh, Homo habilis is really our first uh, species to receive the whole the, the genus Homo. So, 2.4 million years ago, they're really ancestors that are also bipedal. Uh, but they can use tools. That's why there are no abilities. But they obviously experience life on this planet by obviously trekking, so walking. So they survive by transporting themselves. And there's no canoes and sailboats. There's no other modality of transportation. They have not domesticated an animal like a, you know, a horse or dogs. You know, so they have to to hike. That's the modality. Next. Uh, <laughs> In their shape, it's us, <laughs> Homo sapiens, about 350,000 uh, years ago. And I hear a beautiful couple of hikers here. <laughs> so the uh, they're themselves traveling again, and they travel because they follow herds, perhaps. Perhaps they do migration uh, for you know, hunting and gathering. So they have to be traveling, uh, and, that, and that's what they do to survive. Finally, us, modern uh, Homo sapiens. So again, <laughs> wonderful couples here uh, with hiking again still. Uh, because I think, again, it's part of a gene. That's what we are good at. You know? we're, we're bipedal animals. And uh, obviously, we need a little bit more equipment now. <laughs> we're a bit more dependent than our, our ancestor. They could do a lot with very little. But today, obviously, we still you know, uh, seek to go out in the mountains or the forests or uh, around the lakes because we have this gene inside us that says, you know, we're meant for hiking, and that's how we explore and discover and enjoy life on this planet. So next, next slide, if you want to make that point a bit more, more uh, obvious, is that I, uh, I basically look at uh, uh, just Homo sapiens in our existence, so 350,000 years ago. If we, uh, if we reduce that to a 24-hour clock, okay? Well, just to that, as a species, as Homo sapiens sapiens, we have been hunting and gathering for about 338,000 years ago, which means about 23 hours and 11 minutes. So the next slide, the next click here, that's us here, Neolithic Revolution, about 12,000 years ago. This is when we start to, you know, uh, cultivate, do agriculture, domesticate some animals, and become more sedentary, where hiking was not part of our daily life or survival. So what some of the... Uh, thinkers in outdoor adventure education, like James Neal from Australia. He has this PEP theory, which stands for uh, Psycho-Evolutionary Theory, so PEP. So his PEP theory <laughs> is uh, that uh, we are so ingrained in our gene regarding our ability to travel bipedal that that's why we still do. And today, even today, with our 
life that is away from the natural world, uh, we are seeking, like some of the panelists said, we're seeking that need to go back and do something that we're so well designed for and was so, so successful for us for so many thousand years ago. So, only about 49 minutes, you know, <laughs> of things today to read. The rest of the time we've been That's walking and hiding all, all over the places of the species. So that's what I think uh, we like. That's great, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Such different perspectives, huh? <laughs> I love the evolutionary view. Um, a couple things that struck, struck me uh, when what you were saying was, um, kind of this thinking of when it start for us to be hikers was really interesting. And also a couple of things of describing places that we go as something, seeking something that's maybe more risky, but yet also for some seeking an area that may feel more safe. So which is it? Yeah, or, or both. So um, at this point, I want to ask the audience, why do you hike? Uh, we have some other questions, too. So let's take a few comments from the audience here, if you're so willing to help, help us think about this question a bit. Who has an, uh, who has an idea I want to share? Yes, here in the front row. Uh, I'm also a coach. And just recently, I've heard that walking is one of the best recovery things that we can do. And so it would sort of tie in with that evolutionary uh, point, but uh, if somebody's healing, I'm a rowing coach, and they say the theory is now even better than going out and just taking a light row is to walk. And I think in part it's because it gets the, I don't know, there are probably a lot of reasons, but getting the blood pumping, getting the junk out of your system, pumping new stuff in, um, and, and also to, to visit, it's, I used to think that long hikes and car rides are the best way to spend some time with friends or become friends uh, because it's so interrupted. Now, it's obviously the cell phone gets in the way more and more all the time, but, uh, but that's another big way of catching up with people and, mm. and visiting. Good point. Somebody in the back had a, their hand up or on the side here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. In 2017, I went to uh, Cori, Italy, uh, which is a city built on a hill. And I remember that just in that month, as I went up and down this hill, I lost 15 pounds by the end of that experience. And so I think I personally hike. I, I hike because one, it clears my mind. Um, I tend to, I think in this generation, we spend a lot of time on different screens. Uh, screen addiction has become a thing as a result of it. But getting away from that and just being surrounded by the fresh air, by the pine, by the sound of the birds, the water moving, creaking, creaking along, there's something therapeutic about it for me that allows me to think, that allows me to clear my head, um, and as my experience in Cody showed me, it also helps to uh, be healthy, to keep a sense of, of, of wholeness, of balance. So I think that there is something therapeutic, there is something spiritual about hiking that draws me to the mountains. Anybody else? So I think for me and possibly a lot of the younger students or people in the audience, we've always grown up in a world that's primarily based around technology and new things being discovered. And it's all, we're always seeing like, this is the best way to do something. No, this is the best way to do something. And we're just living in like this society that seems to keep on going faster and faster and it never stops and we're always overwhelmed and stressed out and anxious about what's the next thing we're going to complete and do and how are we going to do this and it's, it's a pretty stressful thing to have to deal with and especially being born into it and shot into it it's a hard thing to deal with and I think for me personally going out into nature whether it be hiking and it's primarily hiking or running or anything like that. It's just a way kind of to slow everything down 
and remind myself that even though a big portion of my life is based on like modern things and movement, there is a place that it's been this way and it's always gonna be this way. And just seeing it is kind of a very peaceful reminder that there's always gonna things, are gonna be things that stay the same and there's always gonna be things that bring calmness and a sense of kind of being one with the world that really sometimes seems to move too fast to actually grasp it sometimes. Thank you. Any other thoughts at this point? We can grab the microphone up here. Um, I hike because it, when I get to like the top of the mountain, I am reminded that the world is a very large place, and in retrospect, I am very small. The problems I face with are very small, and so I just like to get up there. And like, if I'm looking out at other mountains, like over a lake, I just get to like stop and think and be like, whatever I'm going through right now, like it's little, I can overachieve it. I got to the top of this mountain, I have everything. <laughs> like I can do it, and I just like it refreshes me and allows me to get through the week. <laughs> That's good. Maybe that relates to needing to, to walk uphill at times and <laughs> kind of pursue that. Um, I want to take a step into moving, a, to ask a couple questions here. Um, when several of the panelists talked about professionally hiking, uh, meaning, I guess, getting paid to hike, how many of you have ever been paid to hike as part of your job? Quite a few. Isn't, isn't that awesome? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's sometimes nothing better than getting paid to hike in terms of... <laughs> when it's raining, of course. Yeah, even when it's raining so much. It's a sunny day in the office. As part of exploring this idea of why do we hike, I thought it was important that we think a little bit about what is a hiker and to get at some of those reasons why. So um, I'm going to ask for a show of hands about our goals and reasons why we hike beyond getting paid. Um, who here has hiked all the 4,000 footers in the, in the region? Only one of our panelists. No, oh, two. Sorry, have you, you couldn't raise your hand. I wasn't going to raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, who, who's done the grid? Yeah, Can that's you a, explain the grid? The grid. I'm going to let Tim explain the grid. <laughs> you, really? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all. I have completed six grids. Uh, I'm close to completing a seven. I'll explain what a grid is in a moment. I, I wish I had never, ever been put on this path. <laughs> uh, a, grid, a grid can be completed over a lifetime, or it can, can be completed in, with some sort of fanaticism. That would be someone like me. Um, a grid is all of the official 48, 4,000 footers in New Hampshire uh, done each month of the calendar year. So, as I say, I wish I had never <laughs> been told about this. <laughs> um, the, the sort of god of the grid knew who I was and pestered me for literally seven years whenever we bumped me. He said, you, surely you've done a grid, and I would just go silent. And uh, I did not realize what eventually conceding to him would involve. <laughs> but the worst possible thing for a person like me is that people started to, because I sent in a photograph not knowing what that meant. And I really like your statement about technology because I'm a resistor, <laughs> really. Uh, but people started to recognize me on the trail. Oh, you're Tim Muska, and I think like, well, who the heck? You know, what? <laughs> and oh my God! And uh, you, how, where are you? How many times have you done this? And and all I will say about the grid is that it is not for an anti-teleological person like myself. So the telos meaning goals or ends or purposes. Mm -hmm. That is not why I am up there. Mm -hmm. I am much more interested to use the cliche in the in the journey and. the and, and, and going back and back and back. But yes, that is what the grid is. So it's 48 4,000 footers times 12, seven, 576 hikes. And you've done it several times now. <laughs> All right, but he's the only one in the room, right? No other, nobody else? Okay. Um, I think we, how about being a redliner? Yeah, a couple more people. 
One just finished, what, a month, in the last month? Yes? Yes. Both two of you just finished in the last month? No. There's two of you here. Oh, that was over. <laughs> okay. And Ted, you finished just like? October 25th, just a couple weeks ago, really, a few weeks ago. So red line, who knows what that is? It's, I think it's, it's every trail in the AMC's White Mountain Guide, is that correct? I don't even know. Yeah, so how many hikes? Okay, lots of trails, lots of miles. <laughs> Okay, so there's other versions, yeah. Yeah. So there's sometimes people that will redline just one map or one smaller area, but officially a redliner is all the hikes in the White Mountain Guide, AMC White Mountain Guidebook, so all the different maps there, doing all the trails basically. So that's another big accomplishment. Um, who here keeps lists of when they've hiked and where they've been? Yeah, a few of you. Okay. <laughs> so that record keeping is sort of important sometimes. Um, how many of you just kind of wander around from time to time? <laughs> maybe that's the more common one, which is maybe a good thing, too. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, what is a hiker? Um, how many of you practice leave no trace? Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Hike, uh, know the hiker responsibility code. Actually, I don't think I can. Follow all the hike safe guidelines. Uh, I can't recite those. Good. Okay. <laughs> Would you say your pack is heavy or light? Oh, absolutely. I'm failing. I'm heavy. Heavy? There's like a term, right, for the people that are really obsessed with lightweight packs? I don't even know what it is. <laughs> what is it? Graham weenies. Graham weenies, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, right. <laughs> who who wears sneakers now when they hike versus heavy boots? Uh, Lightweight yeah. shoes? I had a swing back to the boots for a yeah. while. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I think there's lots of different approaches to why we're out there that also influences what we're doing, how we interact, um, that kind of thing. Um, who's been lost on a hike? <laughs> Who's been rescued? You don't have to answer that one. Oh, one brave soul. Who should have been rescued? Yeah. Yeah. I came across someone randomly. Oh. I was lost. Oh. Okay. That is. Okay. Got it. But you haven't been carried down on a stretcher. That's good. I'm glad nobody has been here. That's never a fun thing. Um, actually, I, my, I think it was sixth grade class on Mount Monadnock. We got lost somehow. A storm came in. We bushwhacked our way. Long story. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, any other thoughts about what is a hiker? How do you define yourselves? And panelists, do you have any further definitions about think, thoughts of... Yeah. Yes. You got. Sorry. The way that I got into hiking was as a tool to 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 get to climbing areas. Yeah. yeah. Um, I I started by going to Knowles many years ago, and got into the habit of where you'd go hiking in order to climb something, and that has stayed with me. I've done all the four thousand footers in New Hampshire. And that's been the bulk of the hiking that I've done. I cannot conceive of doing the AT. Um, 2,000 miles of boring uh, without any peaks. Um, that's great. <laughs> All right. So another thought about hiking, too, is we often, it's not just about us as people and defining what a hiker is, it's also thinking about the spaces and places that we go. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time, and I want to turn back to the panel, maybe a couple in particular that have had um, some of their work really is about uh, creating those spaces and places. So um, 
just, yeah, what do we think about that? How do we, how do we create trails in the places? Um, you know, how do we have lands that are, we are able to go out and go hiking on um, and have the, have the trails in order to do that? So do you guys have some thoughts, a couple of you? <laughs> well, one of the stories I do want to share, we'll see if it came it out. Uh, no, I, I got good decibels. Can anyone not hear me? The, yeah, the, for the video. For the video, one, yeah. for real? Oh, yeah. God. Um, is that, is that working? Am I yes. create feedback? All right. Uh, one of the, th to answer the previous question, which bleeds into how I'm approaching this now, is, um, and I, I'm not, there are, there are days in which I wax extremely philosophical and romantic. I'm not sure why, but you got, you're all getting me on a very kind of practical day and a very sort of, uh, authentically rebellious day. And, um, one of the th reasons why I originally struggled with answering the questions about what defines a hiker is that because of how I was raised and the community that I was raised among, I always ask who's being excluded whenever we define something. So when we choose to define a hiker in all the ways we just did, who are we not inviting? Who are we indicating doesn't belong? And um, I ask this question a lot in my work now. I now work in land conservation, so I've shifted from trails, infrastructure development to creating permanent conserved spaces and then setting up the regulations by which those lands will be managed heretofore until our legal system devolves. Um, and uh, I ask those questions a lot because we think we know what we know now about what's a venerable thing to protect. We protect our snowmobile trails, but we don't always protect a hiking trail. We protect a hiking trail, but there's, there may be a sacred site there on there that's part of a non-federally recognized or state recognized tribe. There are ways that other communities engage with our landscape that we don't have the legal tools to raise them up because our legal tools are so skewed and biased towards particular um, identities. And I struggle with that personally. Um, to, and I, I, am, I am a fully abled person, um, but one of the biggest eye rolls that I always fought the hardest against was when I would manage my staff and we'd have to build an outhouse, Marianne knows these kinds of stories, deep into the remote wilderness of the White Mountain National Forest and I got a lot of resistance as to why we had to build that outhouse as ADA accessible. Someone can't get there. And my firm answer was always, for a long time our dominant population knew a lot of things that weren't possible by women, a lot of things that weren't possible by people of color, and you can't tell me that you know what someone in a wheelchair can and can't do because it's a right that they fought for and it's a right we're going to recognize today. And yeah, it's a more expensive outhouse. It's a bigger outhouse. They're huge. They're sometimes the size of shelters because you have to have a wheelchair turn around completely in an ADA accessible outhouse. And there was always a resistance about why people believed that was necessary and they thought it was completely unnecessary. And when we believe things like that are unnecessary, that's the dominant narrative asserting itself and indicating that some identities and some people aren't welcome. So like I said, all y'all are catching me on a very, very practical night. <laughs> this is not one of those days where I'm throw. This is one of those days where I'm Noam, Noam Chomsky. So uh, cheers. That. So, so thanks. Sorry, say, June. No, that's fine. <laughs> hey, I apologize. Ryan, do you want to talk about some of the trail oh, aspects or putting you on the spot? Um, yeah, trails. So I spent a significant amount of my time, still do, on trails, building trails, consulting on trails. And actually, quite honestly, part of me is sort of almost sick of dealing with trails um, because it did involve my professional life and still does, uh, still do. Um, it's, it was interesting, the evolution of trails and where it's, it's, it's on a continuum. Sorry. And uh, that these, especially trails in White Mountains were just trails cut by, by someone, a group of people for various different purposes. Sometimes it was actually more practical than just going to a summit and, and, uh, Sometimes just going to a camp or you know, logging purposes or a reuse um, railroad grade that was used for logging. So it's, I really find the history of why trails are uh, where they are fascinating. Um, but I also find fascinating is the evolution of trail work in the sense of, uh, like just for instance, there are a lot of, this is, this is sort of a big thing I'm grappling with you know, so, so in the trail world, like rock work, everyone's like, woo, look at, you know, rock work is like the, the high dollar, 
piece. Everyone wants to see the big rock steps, et cetera, et cetera, rock steps and structures like that. But it becomes almost so dominant in, in the landscape, it becomes very manufactured. And it's hard, it's, it's a hard thing to, to, to deal with when you're, when you have that eye for it. Like I'll go hiking someplace and sometimes all I'm looking at is the trail structures. That's all I see. It's like, well, that's huge. Was that really necessary or is that? So it almost becomes a deterrence for me as a trail builder. And then, and then I start looking at, this, so I'm a little neurotic about this. I'll start looking at what people are, how people are hiking. I'll go to places where I know I built, you know, rock steps on Mount Garfield, for example. There's some nice rock water bars up there. And now I'll notice because a lot of people wear shoes now. You know, um, this is a theory, but a lot of times they'll be walking around the trail structures we build. So it's just very interesting because they might not walk through the mud because they might not be wearing boots. Because when, when I grew up, you wear boots, you walk through the mud. The boots are meant for the mud. And so it's, just, it's a very different ethic um, at times now in terms of in hiking and how we hike and uh, how do we, do we accommodate for for all sorts of uses on trails, or do we restrict? And I think that's an ongoing question with land managers, trail builders, um, because some of the trail structures in the White Mountains, actually some of them aren't even being used anymore. And I just wonder the sustainability of the whole thing, actually. Marianne, you want to comment? <laughs> So on the White Mountain National Forest, we have over 1,200 miles of hiking trail. And try and close one of those miles. <laughs> but we have to maintain that 1,200 miles, and then you add another 480 miles of snowmobile trail on top of that. So it's a huge job. And one of the questions that she gave us um, ahead is like, how is land conservation an important part in making places to hike? And I think it's really unique for a lot of us that live in this area that we have 1,800 miles of trail right out, almost right out our door. Whereas where I worked out west, because um, a lot of trails here go across private land, and those private landowners have opened their land for that. You don't see that out west. So it's not like, you don't see 1,200 miles of trail in an, in an area that hmm. people can go. And it is a dilemma, how do we maintain that? And that's something that we're working on with a bunch of our trail clubs and volunteers and trail adopters and the newly formed White Mountain Trail Collective. So it's without a lot of people and a lot of help, we won't have those trails. Yeah. Thanks. Other thoughts? Um, I have a lot of Noam Chomsky in me as well. Um, I've, I've been documenting for years with a camera uh, trail damage. And I will say, um, anticipating some pushback, that the AMC for several years now has been pushing the convenient narrative that trails were damaged by two hurricanes in recent times. And that is partially true. But... I'm going to throw out there as a $64,000 question. Do you have any idea what the principal cause of trail damage on the most used White Mountain Trails is? I bet you don't. I bet you have no idea whatsoever, and I have documentary evidence. And that is, and it's great for a particular manufacturer of this product, which was not around when I was a kid, hiking poles. And there are two reasons. One. 95% of people who use hiking poles, and keep in mind that I am an advocate that poles should be used only in winter, 95% of users of hiking poles do not need them. That is a fact. Of those users of hiking poles, 99% have no idea how to use them. Hiking poles should be used for balance only, tap, 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 little light wings. They should stray no further than the parallel of the shoulders. But if you look on what we call the sidewalls of the trails, on the most traveled White Mountain trails, you see repeated evidence, day after day, hike after hike after hike, thousands of poles 
destroying plants, little tiny bits of flora that will never recover. And what ends up happening is the trails that I can remember that I hiked on when I was nine years old are now basically the width of carriages. And again, the AMC, because I'm not really sure why, the AMC is pushing a very different narrative. The pole manufacturers are extremely happy. And all I would say, and this is the Noam Chomsky part of me speaking, I would say that when you go hiking and you have that instinct to bring your poles, leave them in the car. <laughs> Trust in your balance. Uh, very, very important. Hmm, good point. Thoughts from the audience about hikers, hiking spaces and places? Yes. Um, so I'm very new to um, the, well, working within the trails community. Um, so I've been at an organization where we maintain um, 55 miles of trail, um, and I'm responsible for that now. Um, and I think something that's really interesting that um, I think about almost daily is um, the um, balance of hiking and access with wilderness, um, which June sort of brought up. Because um, I think a lot of times we get this pressure of, oh, more trails is good, more access is good. Um, but where do you draw the line in terms of protecting um, what we um, what we're, we're there to appreciate? Um, and I know there was recently a publication, I forget who it was by, about um, how much the trail corridor extends from just that track that you're walking on um, and how it's like, I think like 400 feet um, outside of that trail quarter that's really, really impacted. And then there are greater impacts based on um, everything else around that. Um, so just something that um, I've been thinking about a lot and my organization's been thinking about a lot um, to add to the narrative. Another thing, just real quick, is um, we recently built a trail that has a lot of switchbacks with the idea of it being um, more sustainable and reducing erosion. Um, speaking to Ryan's point of, um, not trying to avoid having to build any sort of like rock staircases or water bars. Um, and it's interesting, the feedback that we receive for that is, um, some of the feedback is um, very, very positive and people love the trail. And then we also get the feedback of, well, you could have just cut it straight up and like what this, this seems like a really circuitous route. Um, so another thing that I think is, is really interesting is the dynamic and mentality of individuals who are um, using hiking trails. So. Great, thanks. Yeah. I have something, June. All right. To add some pro, so um, to, as a reminder, I did work within the trail building community for a long time, and um, there was a comment that I used a lot, was that the Northeast, yes, there's poles, yes, there's people, but we have all the wrong superlatives on our treadway. Um, we have the steep, some of the steepest grades in our trail. We have the thinnest topsoil. We have the highest volume of users, and increasingly so, some of the most frequent and high volume rain events that don't get soaked into our topsoil, they wash right down the channels. Um, so for me, that's the more pressing question right now. Um, but I just, that's a really convenient way to explain that it's not about how many trails we have, is how do we maintain the acceleration of impact on the treadways we already have for all, all users, for hikers, all the way to motorized sports, so. Yeah. Gina, I have one quick, uh, uh, I have one quick funny thing. Well, um, it's very productive actually. Actually one of my favorite things to do when uh, building trail structures or trying to figure out what's the best, what, what's, the, what's the best thing to do here? Is it to build something? Is it to redesign, relocate trail? Is actually just watch people. <laughs> And it's a lot, like trail building is a lot of psychology. It is, you know, the human psychology is watch actually where people put their, their feet, you know, how are they stepping. I mean, it's just kind of fascinating to, to watch. 
and, and a lot of trail work is like that. And I, I think that sometimes it's never mentioned. But, you know, that, that was like one of our favorite activities that we're building, we'll be taking lunch, and then we'll watch the next group of people come and use it and see how, and you can see how people are unsure. You know, they're hiking up a mountain, but they're unsure, and there's a little step, and they'll use that. You know, it's just, it's just kind of, I always enjoy that. Anyway. Watching other hikers. Watching other hikers. <laughs> Good. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit back to, you know, again, the theme being why do we hike? Um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, what is a hiker, the spaces that we hike in. But I think there's also another piece to uh, the question of why do we hike, which is really about um, the panel had some great comments in the beginning, but they really are about reflecting upon, interpreting your hiking and your mountain experiences, perhaps. Um, how do we do that? Uh, to help answer that question about why do we hike. There usually is some role of reflection. So I wanted to kind of ask the panel here, uh, and they have they did have these questions ahead of time, so there's a little bit of a prompt. <laughs> um, but thinking about the role of things like art, writing, journaling, blogging, social media, other forms of expression that may be newer or old, um, how do they play a role in our reflection and interpretation of our hiking experience to help us define why we hike? So I'm going to turn back to the panel, um, and maybe Will, do you want to share some thoughts about that? Happy to. Yes, yeah, so we got to yeah. get the microphone there. Um, and if if you'll forgive me, um, part of what Sally and I may have agreed to do is. Um, uh, read some excerpts from our... Um, Did I just get segued? I think so. Uh, our essays, and I definitely wanted to read before Sally. Um, I don't want to follow her. So um, I will... Um, Does this make sense, Jim? I will share uh, an excerpt from the essay that I... Um, that was published in this New Wilderness uh, Voices book, and um, I won't apologize for this being somewhat youthful, when I wrote this about 12 years ago, um, I was wrestling with exactly the question I think that we are asked tonight. Um, so you'll hear some musing on that, and I also want you to know this, just so you'll have some sense of where I'm going with this narrative. Um, I found as I, was, as I was writing this that I wanted to write about um, experiences in the mountains uh, not unlike uh, Tim has described. That is, times where I felt uh, at home and safe, and yet somehow in the writing of this piece, I found uh, that I was drawn to um, an experience where it just didn't work out. I had a terrible day on a mountain. I'd been working in the backcountry alone. It was late December, I think I was depressed, I was sick, and I climbed a mountain hoping for that sort of, um, you know, ascent of the spirit or whatever, and it just didn't happen. And so you'll hear uh, in this narrative a little bit of that, but I will say that in reflecting on this question about why we hike, uh, that moment of desolation has become uh, important. What is it that draws so many of us to mountain peaks? There is, no doubt, something about the physical exertion of a climb that releases a cascade of endorphins, sparks dormant synapses, and scrambles the workaday neural pathways. But there's more to it than that. The stacked totem pole ecosystems of the northeastern mountains make of our climbs a particular sensory experience. The ascent from hardwood to spruce fir forest to crumb holes to alpine zone, all over a rock-bound, root-snarled treadway, is its own kind of walking meditation. Hiking the trails of these glacier-scoured uplands, we pay attention to each footfall, as we must, but it is a loose attention. Other thoughts are free to come and go through the mine's backcountry, like flocks of crossbills through the firs. A rhythm emerges following the percussion of lung, heart, and boot sole. The scope of our conscious attention constricts as the high vault of maple, ash, and birch tightens, becoming the wet, dark tunnel of squat, spruce, and fir. Then, suddenly, we break through. Encountering tree line, the doors of perception are kicked open. 
Having grown accustomed to a visual world of several square feet, we are suddenly citizens of hundreds of square miles, striding Whitman-like across forests, ridgelines, valley towns, face to face with the fluid undulations of the sky. There is in the hike of a northeastern alpine peak, a performative rebirth, a movement from dark enclosure toward a chilly, breezy rapture and the embrasure of a wider, chancier world. Mountains are eruptions in the landscape, but it is also clear with a little imagination that they are events, waves which rise and fall on a stony sea. As ocean waves express the fluid energy of wind and water, mountains implicate everything around them. They make immediately tangible to us forces which are with us always. Tectonic shift, the broad branching and rebranching of life, the transformative flow of the water cycle. They remind us that we are, in fact, as much an embodiment of those forces as the mountains themselves. And we return home reminded of a larger truth, that we no more shoulder the sky while crossing a mountain ridge than we do while stuck in traffic. But we need these wild ridges to remember that this is so, that we're always participating in the economy of the wild world, for better and for worse. This understanding has clear ethical implications. Wilderness ethics don't end at the trailhead. Sorry, and I'll shift into this narrative, and I'll be quick, but I'll get it out. In the lengthening afternoon of that December day, as I hauled myself over the lip of a mountain's headwall, I was lightheaded with hunger, chilled with sweat. I looked east in the direction in which I'd been moving, up at, a, at familiar mountains. Ice-glazed trees white against a flint gray sky. Then I turned around to look down the long valley. There, already obscuring the peaks at the southern end of the notch, was a towering wall of the darkest cloud I'd ever seen. The cloud bank was moving north and east toward me. It moved slowly, but with unflinching purpose, like a slow flood or a glacier on the march. It enveloped everything, the sky's fading light, the peaks and the valley's trough. It was like seeing a negation, like watching the advance of absence. I had climbed that mountain with the last of my strength that day, looking for the solace of the peaks. Instead, in the cold and the dark, I felt the full iron weight of winter. Winter, which is the world being what it will be, not what we ask of it or what we would have it be. This time, there was no solace. Wildness has a way of attacking our ideas about wildness, about its healing powers, about its place as a locus of easily accessible meaning. And this may be the final and the great gift of mountain peaks. They are a portal to mystery, to the creative process which grounds and surrounds everything, and which we cannot comprehend because it comprehends us. In this experience, perhaps, is the preservation of the world, the realization that we're a small part of something which we will neither fully understand nor master and on which we are entirely dependent. That's great. Thank you, Will. Sure. Uh, Round of applause. <laughs> So Sally, you want to, or Shoot. Tim, you want to read out your poem? So why don't, Sally, you've got the microphone, so you want to go? Um, you want to do I poem? think I went before Tim before, and I regretted it. So. <laughs> Is that okay? <laughs> so Tim's going to share one of his poems with us, too, and kind of thinking really? again about that, um, the role of art writing uh, in our reflection about why we hike. And I'll happily follow it. Uh, June, June asked if I would bring a small poem, so I brought a small poem. Uh, and this you can see across the street, hanging on the wall in the museum. Uh, it's called Birch Grove. I come here, generally speaking, when I want simply and quietly as I can to disappear. You don't talk about disappearing with 
just anyone. Its resolution, these eerie birches, surely understand. I find the best time to visit is an awful day in winter when it's not freezing, but there's raw veiling mist and the black and white trunks are aglow with it. Then I can vanish. In that way, a mountain hides itself from people who only go to wild places hoping for a view. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So um, uh, uh, I have a little bit of, so June's question about what the value of, you know, why write. I have confirmation bias in answering that question because I'm a writer. So it's, it's really not fair to ask me that question. <laughs> it just happens compulsively. Um, but I will say as, as a writer, and I mean lowercase writer, I have a professional job. I have a full-time consuming hot, uh, lifestyle training my dog team. So every two or three years, I publish an essay in Appalachia. And um, reflecting on this one, which was in this book, which was, um, I didn't win the contest, um, but the editor of Appalachia was kind enough to print my essay anyways in the same, uh, same edition, the same journal that the winner was published in. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it is worthy of note in the Sally Manikian style that the most recent essay I wrote for Appalachia was about going on my childhood vacations in Florida. So I've kind of fallen from <laughs> my wild youth, but I think the tone is still there. Um, uh, the editor of Appalachia usually writes my bio. I, I haven't done it in a few years, and mostly because, uh, I don't know, it's how many times can I say Sally Minikin lives in Shelburne with her disabled siblings and her 30 sled dogs. So and then one of the most recent ones, uh, Chris said Sally Minikin is lives in Shelburne with her 30 sled dogs and her disabled siblings. But she also writes essays for this journal for the past 12 years, always with a lens with one foot in civilization and one foot in the wilderness. And, um, and when I originally thought about what to read from this, I actually picked what I thought for me was the most timeless part that resonated today, which was the description of the natural beauty of winter from the winter I spent at Grey Knob where I fell in love with the Alpine Zone in a way that sunk so deep in my soul that I feel the most myself when it's 10 below out. Um, but in rereading it again tonight, let's see if I can find this fast enough without breaking my rhythm. Um, I didn't mark it. I don't even think this is my essay right now. Where is it? Uh, I'm 17. Nope, that's not mine. Oh, here we go. This is, this is, now we're at least in my essay. Let's see if I can find the, the sentence that I struck in. Um, I'm gonna make sure this is it. I, I did prepare, I did, you know, it's, but um, I, I, I change in responding to what I hear. So I, my preparation doesn't always ring true when I actually sit in the seat and I'm given the microphone. Um, but at the end of my essay, I stopped talking about my daily minutia of what it meant to live in the wilderness, of what it meant to build trail in the summer and live in an unheated cabin at the edge of Timberline in the winter. And when I wrote this essay, and I said this to Will before we sat down, I was like, I was full of so much angst. And he's like, really? I couldn't tell. And I said, really? That's why I wrote this essay, was because I was mad. And what I was mad at is that I felt that there was a narrative that was missing. And what I felt was missing was how we define these outdoor positions and what voices we elevate to describe them. And all the voices that had been raised ahead of me were men, including Will's. Before I walked into my job at Grey Knob, and I shared this story recently um, at a, on a panel about gender in the outdoors, everyone informed me, based on an essay Will had written and published in the Randolph Mountain Club, that all the men would outcompete me in their winter experiences. Like, oh, you're training for Denali? Or try. But the thing is, I wasn't even invited to be part of that competition. I was, I was clearly assigned the role of listening. I was not viewed as a peer. I was not viewed as worthy of competitiveness. I was clearly not participating in that same, that same boasting. And I picked up on that. And I was mad. 
And in the elevation of personality in the backcountry, all, all the personalities that are elevated were men, including Will. Sorry. Sorry, not sorry. And I was really mad. And what those men were saying about what was valued in these positions did not resonate in what I found important. Did not resonate with the fact that I couldn't hike uphill at the age of 16, 19, or 25. And so I wrote this essay because I was mad. <laughs> I felt that there was something missing. I felt that there was a humility that was missing. I felt that there was a voice of stewardship that wasn't fully there. And I felt that there wasn't an acknowledgement about the complexity of what happens when we're in the backcountry talking about our experiences in wild places. And so at the end of the essay, I tried to get a little bit bigger than my bridges and tried to actually talk about how I viewed that. And, you know, I just come off of a master's degree, so, you know, I'd studied a lot of political theory, including, you know, Foucault and post-colonialism, and so I was just rife with, you know, systems and symbolism. But, um, you know, at the, at the very end, the very end, this is, this is how I end it, is I say, one of the things I found fascinating as a caretaker is what transpires the nexus between people and wilderness. How individuals, myself included, behave in and interact with the mountains. People come from so many different characteristics and habits and from so many different backgrounds. One of the things one must accept about the whites is the presence of people, and in my time here, I've come to enjoy the people who frequent these hills and the many ways in which they enjoy themselves. To be a good hostess, oh, I can't believe I used that word. And actually, I may not have. This, may have, this, is, this was edited for this book in a way that I didn't fully understand. A uh, hospitable caretaker, one can't pull rank on visitors. I walk a fine line between making conversation and undercutting the experiences of others by imposing my own standards. This can be a challenge in the winter when there always is a time when it's been colder, windier, or snowier. And I'm not just talking about my own experience. There's little room for dialogue when no one is allowed to feel comfortable. But for a winter caretaker who can recall the darkness of December and the deep cold of January, March is spring. Balmy mid-teen temperatures, a warm, strong sun, a long stretch of daylight. Heck, it's daylight until like seven. It's amazing. However, for many people, eight Baltimore college students who have never been in the Alpine Zone in winter, Baltimore, Maryland. You know where that is? The world of March is formidable. Blowing snow, breath-snatching winds, limited visibility, and persistent sub-zero wind chills. I mean, wind chills, do those really count? Yeah, they do. An individual's understanding of the signs and the signified, this is Sally, the master student, is grasped through experience and memory. And as a good, care good caretaker, I refuse to force a hierarchy of standards into that shared realm of experience. An additional challenge becomes, dis this, is, this is the part I was really mad about, was I insisted on becoming uh, demystifying the aura of a caretaker, the vision of this carefree life in the wild, while also retaining the subtle power of the position to command people's respect and thereby their attention. I was this 25-year-old woman living at almost 5,000 feet at the end of Timberland and Mount Adams that people had to hike four miles uphill to get to. I was fascinating. <laughs> so as a result, I expanded on those frequently asked questions to explain my job and show that I am simply a person, person, with practical demand, demands and duties. I wanted to show the small in my life. In some ways, attempting to connect the minutia of a caretaker's day with a grander image of an idealized lifestyle is just as important as connecting the small steps of seasonal change to the grander scale of mountain time. When we talk about those changing seasons, we talk about rime ice, we talk about freezing and leaves falling, those wonderful in indications of small steps of how the world changes around us. I didn't write that, I just improv that right now. In some ways, attempting, oh, I just said that. Uh, branches of political theory and philosophy, oh, Sally, the master's student, argues that the nature and direction of politics begin on a small scale, with an individual self-understanding and minute actions. The personal is political, specific actions become tied to a broad scale of change. Caretaking is a lifestyle composed of the small things. The incremental changes you make in your own habits and routines to fit the changes in the landscape. You form a strong relationship with the place. It's a uniquely backcountry life. But maybe I'm suggesting something a little more ambitious. In sharing these experiences, I'd like to think that I'm, ge I'm gesturing more towards how something as unusual as caretaking is really not that completely unfathomable or alien. And in a similar way, that the backcountry of the National Forest is really not so unreachable either. Seasonal changes occur in the suburbs. In describing the weather, the walks I went on, the minutia of my day, and my interactions with those who wandered into my neighborhood, I'm trying to show that aspects of caretaking tra translate to life outside of the backcountry. These include patience, humility, and community, the authority of land, a sense of self. 
And I'm concerned about this partially because I'm now at a point where I'll be altering my own relationship with the backcountry as I shift from a full-time employee to a steward of a different kind. Yet I trust that what the backcountry changed to me is not bound to the ridges of rock and ice, the woods of birch and moss. Indeed, there are already aspects of caretaking that have wound their way into my life out of the backcountry. The small effects of seasonal change and human action, understandings produced in the nexus of people and wilderness and landscapes I have come to love, do not disappear so easily. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So I also <laughs> wanted to make sure we talk, get a perspective from Christian down there at the end of the table <laughs> um, and thinking about uh, sort of the reflection interpretation about hiking and our experiences out um, as we're doing those, th those kinds of activities, hiking and mountain experiences. How do you share that with students in an educative kind of way. Well, I don't, I don't, I, I don't share, um, ah. <laughs> but I, I may share. So, um, in adventure outdoor education, as a, a big part of our of our <coughs> strategies of instruction is to obviously give experiences, like concrete, real experiences. But um, it's not enough to have just a hands-on approach to learning. It's also important for us to have called a minds-on. So the reflection part after the action is essential so that there is transferability so we can transfer what has been learned through a hike for example or an experience or a challenge so how do we do that we do that through obviously uh, the easy uh, conversation at the end of the day you know around a campfire or around you know a lantern uh, so the open you know conversation about the experience we also do it through other strategies such as writing so we do a lot of uh, journaling um, we do also a uh, group journaling and if you go to the museum uh, I think we have place. Since I, yeah, we place uh, an example of a one tool that we use called group journaling. So it's like a, it's like a really low tech, you know, blog, you know, where people can answer. <laughs> so uh, the journal stays with us on the expedition, tell the story of the expedition from the point of view of different, you know, member of the expedition. Uh, and then also we do art. Sometimes we do art to express, you know, our experiences. We do. I love. We love to do some nature art. They're called La, la FMA, we say in French. Um, and then um, I did try for a little while. Uh, it didn't work for me, but as a teacher, I did try to have a blog, like a real blog, come back from expedition and do blog and try to engage other people. But I don't think I was really <laughs> believing into it myself, so I didn't, I didn't pursue it. Uh, but yeah, we just um, find different strategies to have students reflect on their experience so that the learning can and be transferable. So I know we have some students here. So do you, does any of you want to share some thoughts about that, that process of being out, having an experience, being in a place to have some adventure and how you interpret that and that through, through your classes, through your time? No? Putting you on the squad? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think especially for if you look at this row of students, we just spent our last semester. We just spent our last semester out in the wilderness doing all of our classes outside. Um, it's called our immersion semester, so we went on several different trips, backpacking, canoeing trips. Um, and I think the purpose that is given to that and why um, we have to do that is because of how important experiencing and learning through doing is, especially when you are talking about an outdoor setting because it's so variable. You're never really gonna see the same thing twice. So to be able to be prepared for it, you can't just read a book about it. You really have to go out and just have a bunch of experiences so that every new experience you have, you have a plethora of knowledge to draw from in order to deal with whatever situation you have. Um, going off of what Anna said too with the experiential education and learning and being completely involved, a lot of the emotions really come out when you're in the outdoors. I know that's one thing that draws me to being outside is being vulnerable and being patient, being open-minded. And I think going on these expeditions with this great group of uh, students, peers rather, um, I definitely think we all opened up and a lot of uh, 
self-growing ways, and I know that, like, I, I don't really know how to explain it, <laughs> but I just I just know that like being in the outdoors and being on that expedition, you can talk about it, you can read about it, but until you're actually there doing it, um, your walls will break down because you're in a place you're not comfortable with, and learning how to be comfortable in that place as a group um, is such a huge opportunity, and you'll have that forever. So I think that's also very true to being on an expedition the whole emotional, intrapersonal relationship. So yes. that role of reflection and thinking about it is gives that interpretation in a way to help explain why we hike or do things. I know you do more than just hiking too, right? <laughs> yes. Other thoughts? Do you guys as the panel have anything? Before we ask some audience for questions for the panel? Per? Yes, how about some questions here from Barbara? This isn't really a question, is it? Or a comment? Yeah, this isn't really a question. It's kind of a comment, and it comes from my personal bias of being someone who has had, I've had a variety of experiences, in, but I've never done a lot of really intense hiking, um, partly because I have some asthma issues and partly because my knees are kind of delicate. But um, for me, hiking is a state of mind. And I wish that somehow we could help more people adopt that state of mind without requiring that they climb 4,000 footers. Because I think it's really important to hike to work. Mm -hmm. And hi it's important to hike to the grocery store. And it's important to climb uphill to get to the office or classroom or, I mean, we have students, I love them, but they drive their cars from Russell Street to the PE Center to compete in athletics. <laughs> and I just don't get it. So I wish we as hikers could somehow embrace this hiker state of mind and help people learn the joy of walking, trekking, tramping, because that in itself, I agree with you 100%, Christian, it's, it's just a healthy thing to do, whether it's on the rocks and ridges and roots of New Hampshire, or if it's in the Sierras, or in the Rockies, or in downtown Los Angeles, or wherever. I, I just wish we could really activate a culture of human-powered transportation through our walking systems. And I don't know how you guys feel about that, but... Maybe I should have left the evolutionary slide up. <laughs> Can I answer that? Funny enough, in, I know that in, in outdoor adventure education, what, what we do is that we uh, often organize the time and the space to do this. And I think sometimes in our daily life, the, the pace, like Anna was saying, the pace of life is so fast that we can't afford even a short distance hike because we're behind in our schedule. But a fun thing in outdoor adventure education is we just gave ourselves in our students that time to slow down and do what's basic to live on this planet. We do carry a lot of gear, like those last two hikers in the slide there, but we do slow down and bring it down to very simple things. And then hiking becomes like the cool thing of the day because <laughs> that's like, oh, this is our work. We're gonna do, we do hiking, we we'll go somewhere else, we explore. And then we can, we can do it because we have the time for it. And it could be a few hours, it could be a few days, it could be a few weeks, or a few months. So. Yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. Sure. Then I'll be Sally the uh, <laughs> <laughs> I actually didn't plan on even speaking to this, but this conversation reminded me of a well, a, a decision I made at some point, but I actually didn't feel like a decision at the time. Um, we, my partner Beth, you, she probably could say more eloquently than I can, but we have a, some of a homestead situation. Homestead is kind of a funny word. I don't know always like to use it, but uh, we chose, and we're, because we're able to, and have the ability to, at least at this point, still going further, to walk into our house in the summer and ski or snowshoe in the winter. It's like a little bit less. It's like a quarter mile, um, and it really that space. And it, sometimes it can be pain, especially if you forget your truck keys in the cabin, and you get to and you ski out to the truck and you forget your keys. So that automatically means you're going to be late. Um, 
But that space is so, it's amazing. Because most of the time we get out of our car and bam, we're there. We're at the trailhead, we're at the supermarket. And that, that little bit of time is like a great transition to just being home or being someplace. And, it is, and I, take it for, I think I take it for granted. I forget. And uh, it's kind of like leaving all this. Not that I'm leaving everything at, at the truck or at, at our trailhead at our home. But sort of leaving some of that stuff behind and a transition to domestic life or wherever you're going. So I forgot about that. that <laughs> Sally Disruptor. Um, so I have a I had a friend who I worked with at AMC. Uh, his name was Brendan, and um, as part of his attempt to save money while working for uh, while being underpaid at a nonprofit, was um, to sell his car and ride a bike. And so for three years, he rode a bike from Gorham, New Hampshire, into Pinkham Notch. In all seasons, he got studded snow tires. Um, his bike went through a lot of rust. And as a sort of joke, but based in reality, so I live in Coas County. That's about an hour north of here. Um, so I, I, uh, I think I'm the only one that came from further north by a significant amount. And um, like most rural parts of our state, we're rich in natural resources but low in socioeconomic status. And I wanted to make a jacket for Brendan that said, this is a choice. I didn't lose my license because of a DUI. Because actually in our rural communities, think about who we actually see walking and ask about why do we have the socioeconomic option to drive? I'm actually more concerned about why we're so concerned about people not walking. Well, there's people walking every day and why are we invisible to that? There are people riding bikes every day. There are people walking on the Burl and Gorham Road, which is a state highway in between Burl and Gorham to get from Walmart to their hotel, to their, um, where they live. And so, um, and this is at the northern edge of the White Mountain National Forest. So I think for some people that come to recreate who are based in Boston who don't have cars, sure, they take a zip car, they drive up, they walk around from place to place in their urban environment. I think that I'm less interested in having us as privileged individuals who already hike for fun walking around than asking like, why are we not spending more time ask, like making our places we live walkable for the people who don't have cars to drive around in. That's Sally the Disruptor. Sorry, it's not why we hike. That's, well, I think it's a good point though that hiking can occur in many yeah. forms, if we really think about it, there's no one answer to there's no one answer to what is a hiker or even the places that we hike. Um, I know the focus of the museum and the White Mountains exhibit is walking in the whites in our region here, but I think it's always a good thing to expand that that thinking and consider, um, yeah, what does it mean to to hike? Uh, what kind of privileges come with it? What kind of abilities do we need to have with that? And where do, where do we do that is also important. Because we can hike on streets of Boston or any urban area or Plymouth or on campus. <laughs> um, those kinds of things. So um, is there really a difference between walking and hiking? Um, I'd like to address your comment uh, and also the row of find students uh, and what they're thinking about, I think. Um, my brother is, a, is an ornithologist. He's younger than I am by a year and nine months, and he grew up in the same unhome-like home as I did. And uh, he, was, he, he was, and in many ways still is, the only friend I've ever had in the sense of friendship. We were not permitted to laugh in our household, ever. We were not allowed to converse. And so our first mentor was the wilderness. We spent all of our summers, I like to say, from diapers to divorce in Silver Lake, New Hampshire. And uh, I was going through a difficult period in my life in my 20s. I had moved out to Montana, having never been west of Pennsylvania, having never been on an airplane. Um, and I. I called my brother, who was the ranger in Big Bend National Park in Texas, a job that I should have had, and uh, to provide some solace to me, again, the older brother by a year and nine months. He always made me feel like the younger brother. But he said, you know, Tim, you've been with me on so many bird walks. He said, the, the solace that you need is in this tiny little phrase, learn local. And so I am blessed to have a wonderful and extremely understanding wife 
We've been married 35 years, and I have two extraordinary sons who are now 29 and 26. They both worked in the hut system for three years. They ended as hut master at Lonesome Lake, which is apparently always the exit route. Um, one of them is a much better cook than the other. Um, but one of the things that I did with my boys, and this I think pertains to your wonderful comment, one of the things that I did with my boys, tried to do, uh, my fathering manual was everything that my father didn't do. And I would just take them out into the woods to learn locally. And to put this in perspective for the students, when I was a kid in Silver Lake, we used to walk, we used to walk to the Piper Trail from Deer Hill, which is just over the rise from what used to be the Shikaroa General Store. And that was, that's a good nine and a half miles just on the road. Go up Shikaroa, come back. And I was eight years old, and my grandfather loved it. And the remarkable thing about that kind of local walking was that it allowed for conversation and laughter and just a, a, a real freedom that I didn't know in whatever it is you want to call the environment that I grew up in. So what you're saying, and, and your name is again? Barbara. Barbara, what you're saying is, is so uh, pertinent to me and so important because if I had my druthers, I would refine the notion of evolution the world over. So I often ask my students, what was wrong with the first hammer? Why didn't we stop at the, why didn't we stop at the phone when it looked like this? Um, and, and people think that, reflexively, people seem to think that progress is always sort of good, sort of good. But I ask you this, were we meant physically to hurtle down something called a highway at 60 miles per hour, 90 miles, were we meant to get into a thing with wings and fly across the land? Well, again, just remember that little maxim, learn local, and hiking doesn't have to be uphill, downhill, over a ridge line. As this man so beautifully put it, it doesn't have to be working your way up through the Krumholtz to the Alpine Zone, but it can simply be going out a door and taking a walk because the beauty of a walk is it's always different, even if you do the same walk every single day. Great point. It is always different. <laughs> um, Again, thinking about how we reflect and interpret our hiking experiences, um, I'm kind of curious. Nobody's mentioned any, really anything about social media tonight. Uh, there was a mention of technology and that sort of pressure that some people, especially the younger generation who has always had that around them. But I'm kind of curious to think about that a little bit. Uh, maybe it's an easy way out, <laughs> sort of something we should mention. But there's so many platforms now for sharing. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Who uses things if you want to share or think about? Does that change your perspective on why you go or what you're doing to post something somewhere? Is it another place for reflection? Nobody's, <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> like, like really, I was really, it, it, I was really trying to hold back, but um, I certainly have uh, <laughs> just, it. Just maybe this isn't a sense of hiking, but uh, my experience um, I had a few years ago. I had sort of an apprentice, you could say, called work with me, and he used a lot. You know, his phone a lot for a lot of things, including navigation, which can be helpful at times. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of pretty gifted. I, I have a, a photographic memory for places, and it's it, it surprises myself. I can go one place one time. And I'll remember. It'll be ten years down the road. I'll go. I can remember how to get there again. Uh, so I, I understand that at times. Like working with me, like I don't always expect people to remember, you know, have that sort of memory. But one thing I will say, <laughs> with the small screens 
with the maps, which are, can be handy, I understand. I don't use them, but I can understand how they can be handy. But what we're, we're missing is that geograph that awareness, like maps. When you fold out a map, it's, you know, the, it can cover half this table, this whole table. When you're looking at a screen, like three inches by, I don't know, what, what are those, four, four inches? You're not, see, it's almost such a minute view of the world. I think, it, and with, with working with him, I realized, like, he wasn't seeing, like, okay, so we're here, but we're really, look back, you know, get a good idea of, like, their actual, the the surrounding landscape. And I, and I understood, like, part of it, he struggled with navigation, and I, was, I, was, I often wondered if it was because of the reliance of a little portal three inches by four inches. So it was just like a... I was like, wow, that maps, like a paper map or something of that scale, that's the, an advantage to that. So I'm putting a plug in for maps, for paper maps, or Tyvek maps. They don't require batteries, <laughs> unless it's at night you need a headlamp, but there's also matches and stuff like that. But. So, so perhaps maps Love. are useful for more than just redlining? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, Barbara. Well, I have to say, um, in the last eight years, there's been a huge growth in um, online resources for accessing hikes. And I think what's been so valuable is, I think it was National Geographic that supported the all trails, and REI is um, it's a hiking site. But people take the hikes, they map them with their GPS units, they take pictures, they talk about the location. They really give a lot of firsthand information that is easily accessible. And I think it it helps to encourage people to take the risk and go out there and try the trail. I think sometimes the um, rating scales are a little bit skewed to the more fit. Um, you have to be aware of that. You know, a moderate trail for a beginner is not a moderate trail. It's going to be intense. But, um, but still, there's just a plethora of information now. I do believe in maps, though. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barbara, here. Barbara, a few years ago, uh, I was asked to ask to write a chapter for a book in Adventure Head called Controversial Issues in Adventure Education. And uh, one of the topics I had to, the topic I had to answer was, uh, I don't know if you remember, they still do that, but Backpacker Magazine, for example, or Arthur Magazine, have these titles, the front cover title says, 10 best place to see the perfect sky with no lights, or 15 best quiet place to be in nature. And I was obviously, once you publish that to millions of people, <laughs> guess what happened to those places? They become loved to death. So my angle for this was, uh, I was arguing that these magazines, or those apps now, should be more focusing on how to do those experiences safely, and just leave a bit more room for exploration and discovery, and not give everything to everyone. Because at one point, there is that, that fear, I think, that, that we all have experienced of overcrowding these places that are so popular. So I try to teach my students that try to go to places where nobody goes. Okay? They might not be the most beautiful places, but the benefit and healing that you're looking for in nature will still be there. But you might not be at the, you know, the classic, you know, front page cover shot, you know, the magazine. But it's still going to be really good. So, yeah, do you want to that? Do you have something to say? Do you have something to say? You can go. I've talked a lot. It's your turn. Okay. I'll go after you. Okay. So I'll 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 be relatively um, uh, quick here, and um, I agree. Robert, thanks for, for talking about this. I, th I think there's a real power, of course, in um, some of the technology that people use on the trail. For instance, I have friends who are really good photographers, and I have no doubt um, that their photography of things like alpine flowers, um, you know, because they have that camera, they see more than I do, you know, and it, and it really impresses me. Um, I do spend, a, I spend my, I'm a, I'm a high school uh, teacher, so um, I'm, I'm aware, even though I'm not a, a digital native like uh, many of you may be, I'm around people who are all the time. And um, there's, a, there's a phrase that keeps coming to me out of um, very ancient wilderness literature. I'm a big fan of um, thousand-year-old Chinese wilderness poetry. 
um, which is this remarkable tradition, this sort of mountains and streams tradition of Chinese poetry. It's, um, it's in some ways remarkably contemporary, um, some, of the, some of the issues that these folks are talking about. Anyway, sorry, there's a stock phrase that comes up. And when, when these poets would talk about getting out to hike, um, they would often use the phrase, um, the dusty world, referring to the sort of cities and towns. It's a, the dusty world of human affairs. But of course, it doesn't just mean physically, you know, city, f cities and towns. You know, they're referring to sort of all the, the entanglements that we always find ourselves enmeshed in. I heard some of you talking about all of this. And they would talk about hiking. You know, there was this archetype where they'd get up into the mountains and they would leave behind only for a while the, the dusty world. You know, you can just imagine it, you know, the dust choked streets and all that sort of thing. So one thing that strikes me about um, the students I teach is that they never get to leave behind the dusty world. You know, even when they're, they're you know, they go home to sleep and they're getting, you know, whatever y'all get all night, you know, snap stories, TikToks? I don't know what they are anymore, but you're always getting them. Okay, sorry, I will. And also, I, I do want to relate this um, to, to my experience of, of long distance hiking. One of the things that I found remarkable about um, hiking the Appalachian Trail, and I, I thought it was going to be terribly boring, um, and that was my fear. And it, that didn't happen. What did happen um, was that after several weeks of hiking all day, every day, um, two things were true. One, I found um, in a way that, that was never true before and has not been since, that I remembered my dreams. And I remembered them so vividly. So I'd wake up every morning and all day I would walk with my dreams. Um, and I think it was because, and this was before social media took over everybody's lives, but I think it was just a lack of... Um, you know, sort of the noise coming in. I mean, I, I think that I was alone in some ways with my mind. The other thing that's true, and Ryan, you reminded me of this. Um, I don't have a good sense of geography, it's terrible. But I remember um, those several months along the Appalachian Trail, I remember um, meeting people and I remember the stories that they told me and I remember exactly where we met. And I remember their trail names. Many of them I haven't, I haven't seen since, but I've heard from them, you know, someone, uh, you know, every couple of years, someone will get in touch and they'll say, hey, you remember me, my name's Achilles. We spent that one day together, you know, on this mountain. And um, I also think that that has to do with the fact that when I was there with them, I was there with them. And I think that's getting harder and harder to do. So obviously technology is double-edged, but um, that's what I'm thinking about. So I want to just keep an eye on the clock here. We have a few more minutes, so I do want to ask the audience for questions and Open it up a little bit more. We have, uh, we have a student back here first. Thank you, thank you. Um, so on technology, do you think that it can be beneficial like to teach um, different types of technology in the outdoors for people? Like on our trips, we had each trip, one trip we didn't use any, and then one trip we only used technology to like get our own opinions. What are your thoughts on any types of technology, like modern technology in the outdoors? I think it's really important to, to know how to use both. Um, the White Mountain, there's many places on the forest that you will have no cell coverage at all. So if you're dependent on your phone to guide you where you're going, you're probably going to be lost. And you, hopefully you'll have that map with you. But the reality of today's world is people have technology, so you should know how to use it, but you should know what to do when it doesn't work. Other questions? Marianne, did you want to make a... Christian, I was so glad you mentioned that about um, sort of etiquette on the trail. We haven't talked about it that much, but lately I've just been really thinking about humans as an invasive species. <laughs> you know, the population's increasing, um, and I had a graduate student when I was at University of Maine who worked um, at the Cairns um, in Acadia analyzing why people were building Cairns all over the place. And mostly he found that it was families just wanting an activity to do. So it wasn't malevolent. It was just an activity, but it was very problematic in terms of people going off in places and trampling vegetation. And then I was um, out of the country hiking and where we had to uh, clean our boots because of carrying plants. And so I just am so conscious now about uh, so many people and impact and I guess polls now too. Uh, so I do like promoting, and I think you mentioned it, June, about the 
leave no trace and all of those principles and doing more to educate people on the, in that realm. Good. Other thoughts? Questions? Pass that down. Um, so my thought on technology, um, I work somewhere where we bring the kids out of their comfort zone, take away their technology, any connection to their parents. They can write letters um, for three and a half weeks. And in those three and a half weeks, like our girls completely remember all of their experiences. They're not relying on their phones or anything to document that experience, which kind of like brings it into the brain more. So I think like with the technology, it's easy to get wrapped up in just capturing every moment and it doesn't completely set in your brain about the beauty, like the beauty and how you're feeling in that moment. It doesn't capture that. So like with the reflection, it's, I guess for some people, it's easier to reflect in that way because they might be used to just taking photos and be like, oh yeah, this is how I felt in that moment. But I think otherwise, just writing down and reflecting is a lot like easier, I guess, for me um, to have it like just stick in my brain and not forget that experience that I had. Okay, thanks. Other thoughts about why we hike? Why do you hike? I'll give you this one because it's a closer ride and click the other one. <laughs> I often think of a comment that um, Tiger Woods made about why he likes to go scuba diving. And he said, it's because the fish don't know who I am. <laughs> and, and the way that um, getting out into nature is, um, nature is tough-minded. It doesn't care who you are. And the lessons that kids learn, all of us learn, um, uh, by being out in a place where uh, in many ways our status doesn't mean anything. Um, and this is sort of jumping, but uh, there are things that have probably connected with everybody in this room about walking and hiking. And we started off the evening talking about a lot of origin stories. And I'd love to hear about what, if people remember a moment, as an educator, as somebody who is educating kids to get out on the trails more to really get these places crowded. Um, uh, what were some of the moments when you thought, oh my gosh, this is, this is phenomenal. Uh, and we had this, sort of the moment of vulnerability of a father. And um, then there are probably many that all of us have had, but I think it'd be really interesting to hear some of those. Anybody else want to ask? Okay, you got to. Sorry. You have another comment? Uh, yeah. Um, so, going, it's a short story, but going back to the whole technology piece um, that Betsy had briefed on, one of our expeditions, we were bringing modern technology. So, you know, we were bringing iPads, and we had two iPads and a couple chargers and you know, we had some, obviously when you're out there you need water treatment and we weren't using the iodine or the aquamere, we were using battery operated um, electro steri pens, that's what they were called, yeah. <laughs> um, so I just think that it was funny and I know, I think, I can't speak for all of us, but I think at some point when we were on that trip, whether there was an iPad slapping you against the chest when you were trying to hike, or you're trying to treat your water and the SteriPen just wouldn't work because it was dead. Um, so I just think it's very interesting. I know our generation is really falling into this modern technology, and I know a couple of people in this room have also briefed on the whole screen addiction, which is, um, I think for us as Adventure Ed majors, um, gonna be a huge healing to those who can learn from that. Um, but I just think modern technology in general is a huge, it can be very vi biased, but I think um, also the whole traditional and making sure you know how to read those maps and have those 
um, sacred tools is, is huge. Um, and a lot of people, I feel, sometimes go out in the woods and are too dependent on technology, and that's when issues can happen. You know, you're too comfortable out there because you have your phone, um, and you don't really know how to read the map, or you probably don't even have a map because it's your first time in the whites. So there's a lot to say for modern technology, and it can definitely, I know, in our major, cause some issues towards um, risk versus benefit. Well, we're almost out of time. Any last thoughts from the panel about why you hike? Any th changes in the ideas as the night's gone on? <laughs> Lessons learned? Yeah, I, I would say for, uh, maybe some same for you guys, but um, um, from a physical point of view, hiking is the easiest thing that we can do. So if I had to bring people in the outdoors and I have to teach them how to paddle, that could be problematic <laughs> to go from point to point B quickly. If I had to uh, teach them how to climb, you know, vertical climb, it might be more problematic. So I always find that um, if I want to bring people in the outdoors and make them enjoy the outdoors, and hiking is the easiest thing. Uh, it's not that much skill f for me to instruct, you know, for them to be successful at enjoying the outdoors. Uh, just one final thing, and I appreciate uh, how articulate you are. Um, I highly recommend you read a short story by William Faulkner called The Bear. Mm -hmm. And there is a character who was in so many respects myself, uh, and his name is Ike McCaslin. He's a boy. He's about 12. And he loves the wilderness, and he is fortunate to have a mentor. And the mentor is a fellow named Sam Fathers, who's half child of a slave and a Chickasaw chief, and so therefore does not have the privileges of some of Ike's kin and kith. And all Ike wants to do is see this bear, this legendary bear, that they call Old Ben. And he knows, he, he knows how to use a compass. He's been taught by his mentor, Sam Fathers, about the wilderness. And he has all these wonderful tricks that we all learn, uh, we hope. And he goes out and he never, he can't find the bear and he comes back as a 12 year old would somewhat frustrated and he says to Sam Fathers and Sam says immediately, it's the gun. And so Ike leaves the gun behind and he's, he's a little, He's fearful, and Sam says, he says, it, it's okay to feel fear, but don't be afraid. And so he goes out, and then he looks at himself, and this is all to your point, I think, that you're making so eloquently. He leaves the compass, and he takes off his watch, and he walks about 10 steps, and the bear just walks right into the path, right in front of him. And there's a wonderful metaphor in that that is perfectly apropos to what you're talking about. So again, when you go out into the woods or into life, just think about, and think about this in the most positive way, think about how little we need to really live. And that's all, so thank you for that. Thank you. Well, we, uh, one last comment here. <laughs> Sorry, I that's fine. that this might be a nice yeah. piece. Um, I think I'm a big fan of the Inuit because I feel like we can learn a lot from them. Um, and so I wanted to, cl I thought that these Inuit words would be pretty powerful for us to think about as we close. Um, I learned some words. I've been working in the outdoors about 30 years, taking out students on expeditions. And I learned this word that I teach every group. And I feel like it is why I hike. Um, <laughs> Actually, two words. So I'm going to teach you one. The first word is kovia shatuk. Can you say that? Kovia shatuk. You have to close your eyes to listen to this one. Total awareness of present moment and place with great joy and without desire. That's one. And that's one of the reasons I hike. The other reason is a little different. It's the opposite. It's nuanarpuk. Can you say that? Nuanarpuk. And Nuanarpuk is the kind of word you scream at the top of a mountain with your group. And it means 
taking extravagant pleasure in being alive. Right? So that's why I hike. Mm. And I thought I wanted to share that with all of you. Thank you. That was fantastic. Yeah. So we are reached the end, a couple minutes over. Um, I, I, I have something I wanted to share in my thoughts. Just um, There's a lot we could say here, but I just have one short quote here um, written by a woman named Edith Cook, and she wrote this in 1885, all right? So a little time, time frame here. And she was talking about hiking, and she said, the mountains give to us what we take to them. The mountain paths speak to us with our own voice. They are only echoes. <laughs> I thought that's another good way to look at it. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. And certainly thank you to all our panelists here. It's been a lot of fun. So. Take care, everybody. Have a good hike. <laughs>